everybody. Welcome to Module 3, uh, Introduction to Criminology. Uh, what we're going to be looking at in this section are ways that we measure crime, uh, as well as looking at policing. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to give equal time to both. And, and the reason why is other courses um, you may not go into as much depth in crime measurement as we're going to take a look at here. Uh, however, as part of this program, you're going to have a course that does nothing more than take a look at policing. So that's kind of my logic for, for not going into as much depth about policing. Uh, however, you will also have some readings on policing, and you'll also uh, be looking at policing um, as part of this week's research exercise. All right. Okay. So why, why is crime? We want to know whether crime's going up or down. I think that's something that we can all agree on. The problem is, though, is crime is very hard to measure, okay? First of all, legal codes um, and legislation and statutes that, that, that govern criminal behavior are very dense. And to be honest, most of us can violate these statutes very easily without knowing it. For example, taking a look at the Motor Vehicle Code, all right, um, estimates are that approximately at any given time on the road, 80% of all vehicles are violating the motor vehicle code in some way. I mean, do we report a crime uh, for every time uh, that you find yourself going five miles over the speed limit? Of course not. All right. On the other hand, there's also a point of view that can be made. Somebody standing in one place for a long period of time is technically loitering. The question is, is, is it loitering if somebody doesn't want them there? Loitering is a term that, that, that we all do at some point or another, but at what point, uh, so do we consider that to be something that's criminal? While there are difficulties, we need to have an idea of how we're doing because we need some sort of measurement that gives us a gauge about, gives us a gauge as to how safe we are here in society. So this is the difficult task we have among us, uh, we have with us. All right. Now, by and large, there, there are two systems that are used to measure crime. The first is the UCR, which is the Uniform Crime Reports. This is dat data that are collected by the FBI, and it's based on crime reported by law enforcement. Uh, it's broken down into violent and nonviolent crimes, and the crime rates are expressed in rates per 100,000. That just per 100,000 people, which makes them somewhat more meaningful. All right. Now, there's some problems with this. All right. Again, it's the most widely used number because reporting to law enforcement is probably the most reliable source that we have when regarding crime. All right. However, there's problems. Not all crime is reported to law enforcement. All right. For example, anytime someone under the age of 21 drinks alcohol, a crime has been committed. Do police hear about every time an underage, somebody under the age of 21 drinks alcohol? so that we can have a valid number on how often underage drinking occurs? Of course not, all right? The other issue that we have is different law enforcement agencies have better or worse records reporting crime, all right? There's also an issue of officer discretion where one law enforcement agency may wanna be very stringent about enforcing laws regarding marijuana. Another law enforcement agency may feel differently and doesn't feel the need to have a marijuana offense be something that is recorded as a crime. Now, why is this important? Because a great deal of our criminal justice policy is based on deterrence policy, which we'll talk about more in a subsequent unit on theory, but it was based on a perceived crime rise that occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. Now, what happened during this time period is indeed UCR related offenses went through the roof. However, what many question is whether the fact that crime went up or whether the ability to report crime went up because computers were slowly being introduced into law enforcement. And that gave a system of connectivity, which created a much easier way of reporting crime and then feeding that data into a central database of the FBI. So reporting efficiency is something that we can't ignore. And the reporting efficiency, and for that matter, the, the, the technological tools available to law enforcement can many times increase 
crime rates without having crime increase. So that's something we need to be really careful of when we use the UCR. The second big, big uh, survey is the National Crime Victimization Survey. And basically what that does is that surveys crime victims, all right? And it asks people whether certain offenses have been committed and then tallies those numbers, all right? So the, point, the good side of this is it frequently will catch crimes, in many cases in areas like sexual assault or domestic violence, all right? Where those crimes have not been reported to police, it's able to capture them and get a more fuller picture. There are two problems with this, though, all right? First of all, victims are not always aware of legal definitions, all right? So as a, res as a result, somebody may, may report that a crime is committed, but not be aware of the complete legal definition as a police officer would to know how appropriate charges, no appropriate charges. And yes, I'm going to hit on underage drinking again because victimless crimes become very difficult to measure. If I am filling out a victimization survey, am I going to say that a drug offense has been committed if I've done that particular offense myself? This again becomes crucial in areas like underage drinking and drug use, which many times are victimless crimes. All right. Now, I'm going to move from this and, and looking at how crime is reported to looking at how law is enforced. And looking at this, we're going to look at the role of police. All right. Now, it's very, very important to realize that the role of policing in this society is law enforcement. All right. By and large, officers do not make law. Well, they don't make law, period. All right. They are simply enforcing the law. However, many times conflict occurs because the people that have the law that are that are being that, that are having the law enforced against them view the face of the police as the people that are creating the law. OK, many times those that come into contact with the criminal justice system will not come into contact with the legislator or somebody that actually wrote a law. They're going to come into contact with the police. Also, conflicts can occur as well. Uh, among police when officers may not agree with a particular law. Where we've seen this come up a great deal are in states that have legalized marijuana. By and large, those that have served in these states as, as police people do not endorse the legalization of marijuana, but they're now finding themselves to enforce a code that they don't agree with where marijuana is legal, and that can create an inherent conflict. Now, law enforcement has various levels. Most important to these levels are the jurisdiction of law enforcement, and many times within these levels, there are specialized tasks that occur, all right? There are three big levels of law enforcement, okay? There is federal law enforcement. Uh, their jurisdiction is valid across the United States, and sometimes because of treaties, they may even have some jurisdiction overseas, all right? There are state uh, examples of this, or the FBI uh, is probably the most noted federal law enforcement agency. There are state law enforcement agencies in Arkansas. We're looking at the Arkansas State Police as being the major, and they have jurisdiction across the state of Arkansas. Then there are local law enforcement. By the way, federal law enforcement is paid with federal taxes. State law enforcement is paid by state taxes. Local law enforcement is normally paid by property tax or sales tax, uh, and that takes two forms. Uh, there is normally a county sheriff's office, uh, which is responsible uh for policing the county however local municipalities may want in addition to that their own police force so for example here in jonesboro arkansas we have the jonesboro police department as well as the craighead county sheriff you'll see that in other counties across the state as well uh, and as a result you'll see that there's an issue of overlapping jurisdiction finally there are certain specialized law enforcement agencies the most common among these is a university-based police force that has jurisdiction on the university, along with local, state, and federal law enforcement, and limited jurisdiction off a college campus. Uh, these are normally designed for situations where people want some sort of police protection that, that taxpayers as a whole don't want to pay for. For example, the University Police Department here at Arkansas State is paid for by tuition dollars. All right. Now, policing uses a number of different strategies. These will be discussed in depth. 
I just want to give you some idea of different strategies that are being used today. Uh, one of the most popular strategies, and this was invented in the mid-90s, is something called broken windows policing. And broken windows policing is designed to be a preventative form of policing. It's based on an essay that, that, that was done again in the 1990s. And what broken windows says is if there's a small problem, you need to fix that small problem, otherwise it'll grow bigger. It's based on the analogy of a broken window, where if you have a home that has one broken window, and nobody comes to repair the window because the house is left dormant, there will be other broken windows until the house becomes in shambles. That same logic is used in policing. So rather than letting minor offenses go, uh, again, this is where we see differences in things like underage drinking and marijuana use, where if we were concerned with major crimes, those offenses might be let go. Instead, we prosecute for those to prevent people from becoming more criminals. This is a very controversial strategy. All right. All right. This is a very controversial strategy, but still is a significant part of the American mainstream. There's also something known as proactive policing. Many times this can be considered a branch of broken windows, but other times it's not. Proactive policing is designed, again, to be somewhat preventative, like broken windows. Uh, however, broken windows involves more of an interaction between a neighborhood and officers, whereas proactive policing uh, is, is normally from the top down in the police agency. If somebody wants to prevent outsiders from coming into a neighborhood, or for that matter, feels that there is a high risk of crime, what proactive police do is they start arresting on a number of minor offenses. Now, the typical techniques that are used for proactive policing, unlike broken windows, which is more arrest focused, are things like giving tickets to people. All right. Uh, many times you'll see proactive policing in place where if an intersection has had a, a number of, of traffic accidents and you see officers all of a sudden pulling people over for running red lights um, or installing something like a red light camera is an example of proactive policing. All right. Uh, it's, it's the fact that it makes one more aware of police presence and that people believe that they will be caught for any sort of an offense. Another popular form of policing, and that's what's here in the video, is CompStat or hotspot policing. Now, they're technically two different types, but they, they run together in that what they are designed to do is use data and create maps where crime is most prevalent. And then the goal is to use that data so that law enforcement can focus its resources here is an example from the, from the NYPD. There's a certain area, it appears, on northern Manhattan that's having some trouble with crime. I believe that northern Manhattan. I can't stake my life on it. Uh, but um, And so it's in those areas where we see the most clusters of crime that officers will put their resources. The last form of policing, and this also has become very controversial, is something known as community policing. And this is where officers meet with community leaders and meet with members of the community to discuss the policing strategies they want. The goal of this is to give residents a voice in policing. However, this is sometimes easier said than done. All right. Now, we see a number of issues uh, that have, have arisen in policing. And by and large, many times these issues are rooted in much deeper issues of race and class differences. Uh, between officers and the communities they police. However, I mentioned previously community policing. And community policing because creates a tension between communities and police about who has voice. Police agencies normally are run from the top down and many times have trouble taking feedback from communities and bringing it up the line to change policing strategies, all right? Once again, as I mentioned earlier, as the police also many times find themselves as the face of unpopular strategies. For example, if city leaders decide that they want to better enforce uh, stoplight and traffic laws in a specific part of town, they're not the folks that are writing the tickets and are coming face to face with the people there, people there uh, who are receiving the tickets. Another issue that frequently comes up is police discretion. Yes, police enforce laws, but officers also have something known as police discretion. Now, while police discretion, like jury nullification, is not something that's completely official, it's something that can occur. And what that means is the officer can take a look at the totality of the situation 
and decide whether that totality of the situation means that an act that may be illegal may be excusable, or an officer may choose for whatever reason to just turn a blind eye. One other issue that, that frequently comes up in policing, particularly when we see investigations into police culture, is the issue of police, is the, is the protective nature of police culture. And many times those that are criticizing the police find this culture very frustrating because they believe it doesn't enable them to fully find out what happened in a given circumstance. Um, again, this is another notion that is incredibly controversial. However, there's also another side of this that the culture needs to protect officers so that they can relate to each other in the workplace and better have team unity. Again, these are issues that, that we will discuss more um, discuss more um, in the police and society class that you'll take later on. Again, I thank you very much for your time. I hope you're finding this course informative. And uh, thank you very much. Have a, have a good day, and I'll talk to you next week.